What a pleasure right. to meet you. How, how, yeah, are, how are you today? You, man. I've got so many questions to ask you. Great. <laughs> so I guess you know a little bit of the backstory about this, that I, I, uh, I've, I've made a record about space as a, as a, you know, as a sort of concept album. I gather you're a big music fan too, like most of us. Yeah, uh, not not nearly as uh, as big or accomplished as as you are, but uh, but yeah, sure. I, I I enjoy music and I've played a little bit. Um, but yeah, I've heard uh, some of the music that's on your new album. I think, and yeah, it's it's beautiful and evocative. No, yeah, great man. I, I, I mean, I, when I began making the record, I, I, I little did I imagine I'd be able to have, sitting here having a conversation with you. What what prompted your initial sort of fascination with our space, and did you always want to be an astronaut? Well, I, I was always intrigued by uh, by what might lie beyond the horizons of where I was growing up. I grew up on a farm, you know, in a pretty limited set of circumstances with mostly just family and the land around the farm in rural Canada. Yeah. So the horizon and the sky was sort of the promise of everything else that might exist. And I, I was reading, I was reading initially uh, comic books and science fiction, reading uh, Heinlein and, and Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke and Edgar yeah, right. Rice Burroughs and, and Jules Verne and all of that, that, that kind of took my brain beyond the horizon. And then, and then Gagarin flew and, and uh, Al Shepard flew and yeah. suddenly it was like, okay, well, this, is, this isn't just science fiction. People are actually doing this. Yeah. And then out came Star Trek, came onto yeah. television, which was like, <laughs> holy cow, this is like yeah. Bonanza Western, but it's, it's happening in space, space with a yeah. crew from all around the world. And, and then 2001, A Space Odyssey, that movie with Kubrick and, yeah. um, and Arthur C. Clarke, that was, that was just uh, hugely mind expanding. And then on top of all that, the United States and the Soviet Union decided to see who could get to the moon first. And and when I was just nine years old, Paul, well, in the summer of 69, um, when Neil and Buzz descended in the lunar lander and touched down and Neil climbed down the ladder, uh, it was as if all of those little boy science fiction fantasy imaginings were actually for yeah. real. It kind of gave me the... Um, the confidence to try and start to change who I was so that maybe someday I might have a chance to, to fly in space also. And, and amazingly enough, that, that did happen and I flew in space three times. Wow, that's amazing. What was the hardest thing about your training? Uh, well, the training is lifelong. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and so I, I started getting ready for it when I was 10 years old. I I thought about what am I going to need to know how to do and so I, I learned to scuba dive and as soon as I could I, I started becoming a pilot when I was 14, 15 years old. I started being a glider pilot and then 16 uh, a yeah. pilot for powered airplanes and and I studied a lot of different things, studied other languages, then I went to universities and I went to uh, four different universities and got various degrees and, and I joined the Air Force and became a pilot and then flying high performance uh, fighter aircraft, flying F-18s and things like that. And then yeah. I went to test pilot school, which is sort of like getting your PhD in, in, in aerospace and flying. Yeah. And and I was a test pilot with the Cana Royal Canadian Air Force, but also yeah. the US Air Force and the US Navy. I was a US Navy test pilot. All of those things, when you ask, you know, what was the hardest part about training? All of those were absolutely necessary training yeah. in order to have the, the reservoir and, and deep toolbox of skills so that I could then get ready to start doing astronaut training. And then I trained as an astronaut for 20 years. Maybe the hardest part was uh, trying to keep it all straight in my head because <laughs> everything, it, it's not just a test that you're going to have, but it, most of it is life or death. Yeah. If you have to remember this thing, uh, and you might only be told it once, and it might have been six years ago that somebody told you this thing, but the moment's going to come where you have to remember that because yeah. it's life or death for you and the rest of your crew. And the complexity of a space shuttle, which was something that you got to see a lot growing up, or much more complex, the International Space Station, 
uh, the, the, the huge myriad of things that you have to understand and be expert in and then also remember. So I think the hardest part of training to be an astronaut was the immense memory task. Yeah. And, and on my third flight, I flew a Russian spaceship. So I was the pilot <laughs> of a Soyuz. So first I had to learn to speak Russian. And then I had to learn everything in Russian, orbital mechanics and control theory and, and all of that. And then I had to qualify and fly this, this Soyuz spaceship uh, by myself uh, in Russian, including all normal procedures and then all emergency procedures. People view, I think, the astronaut job as as physical or or as uh, theoretical, but yeah. a large, a huge part of it is, is cerebral and and yeah. and mental. And and so yeah, I think well, you're the I think best, that's the hardest best, part, best, aren't you? You know, that's the, the you know you really are the, the 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 exceptional few who who have who have the the whole skill set. Um, I mean, I you know a bit of a bit of clarity. I, I got I got as far as flying chipmunks when I was a kid. Oh, uh, that's a great airplane. <laughs> and so. Uh, um, I, I didn't quite have the academic prowess to, uh, to, 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 to make it much further than that. I guess, you know, it's, it's interesting because I've got a load of questions here that I'm just, I'm just trying to pull up. Um, but, you know, the first time you, you, you took off in the rocket, I mean, there must be an incredible sense of fear. Uh, I, I think something I learned relatively early on is that there's a difference between fear mm. and actual danger. They're not synonymous. Yeah. They're not the same thing. Yeah. Um, you can often be fear fearful of something that actually has no danger to you, but you yeah. feel fear. And yet sometimes you're presented with tremendous danger, but you don't feel fear. So we, people ask me all the time, boy, uh, a spaceship must be scary. And, and of course, spaceships aren't scary. Just yeah. sometimes people are scared. And, yeah. and what I learned, uh, as a young pilot and growing up on a farm and all the other things that I've done, uh, is that the, the greatest antidote for fear is is competence. There, you know, there are there are fairly trivial examples. I don't know, dr driving, riding a bicycle, you know, yeah. or maybe riding a unicycle. But almost everybody's ridden a bicycle. Yeah. Bicycles are dangerous. You know, you get going. 30 miles an hour on a bicycle and and you basically have no real protective equipment maybe a helmet but but your knees and your elbows and your teeth are all are all exposed and if you fall off a bicycle going fast you're going to hurt yourself trouble, yeah. especially even at the beginning one of my kids broke both his front teeth off learning to ride a bike so bicycles are dangerous yeah. but if you learn carefully and someone holds the back of your seat and you know maybe you have training wheels and and eventually comes that day where you're turning the, the steering wheel just right and or the handlebars and and you're away, you're wobbly. And then the next time you're less, less wobbly and then suddenly you're a bike rider. Yeah. And after a, a little while of being a bike rider, you're not fearful at all. The, the bicycle is just as dangerous as it always was. Yeah. And, a, and a rocket ship it's just a complicated bicycle it's just a thing that if you can learn how to do all these things yeah. if if you can master the skill then you don't just have to rely on animal fear anymore because because yeah. you and i are not designed to fly rocket ships no, we're not. You know, that, it's it's a, it's not and we aren't evolved to to fly a rocket ship the 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 hair trigger decision making that you have to be able to do, the recognition of subtle signals that might tell you something that's going wrong, the mm. wild, incredible force. The space shuttle had 80 million horsepower. You know, the, the chipmunk that you flew had a gypsy major engine in it yeah. with about 125 horsepower. <laughs> this has 80 million <laughs> horsepower. <laughs> and, and so, and so, it, but but it's it's no different than a bicycle. If yeah. you can spend enough of your life and skills learning how to do this thing, now you actually can experience the beauty of, of it. So tell me about the experience of that first takeoff. What's the experience like? Because I mean, because I, I, I I've, I've had a go on the on the sort of the, the Apollo Apollo Eleven VR. Take, VR takeoff, which was which is great fun when you're looking around and you can see Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong, sure. that next year. But um, I, you know, for me, I just imagine you know the the, the vibration and the you know the, the, you know what's the sound like. 
So I've flown three different rocket ships. I've flown the space shuttle twice, and I've flown the Russian Soyuz once. And uh, they're quite similar. I mean, they're, they're obviously different vehicles, but the, the visceral human experience is quite the same. It's a bunch of things all at once. Uh, it's it's uh, an event that is very rare within your own life. It may only happen one time. So yeah. you've got that psychological side. The danger is extremely high. The danger of dying on my very first space launch, which was on Space Shuttle Atlantis in uh, the fall of 95, we know now my odds of dying that day were one in 38. Whoa. So if you did it 38 times, you would die, you know, statistically. So you also recognize the extremely, <laughs> yeah, you recognize the extremely heightened danger of what you're doing. Yeah. And therefore the necessity of you to be uh, as absolutely good as you can possibly be. Because yeah. you are not a passenger on a spaceship. You are an, an integral necessary part of getting that thing safely to where it's supposed to go. Yeah. And your actions can immediately cause disaster or success. So yeah. you're lying on your back and uh, you know, with your feet up in the air so you can take all that acceleration with the crew around you and um, and the clock is ticking down. And it's been such a long road to get there. You just hope that you're actually gonna go to space today. You know, you're not really, you've gotten over the danger of it years and years ago. There's no fear that day. It's yeah. like, I've already understand the danger. I've accepted the danger. My job is not to sit here and be scared. My job, is to make this thing work and and that's a that's that's a much healthier and more productive attitude to be in there so the clock ticks down about six seconds before launch we start to light the engines because they're hugely powerful and they take a while to get up to full power enough to lift the the vehicle off the ground and they they're uh they're you know so many horsepower they're shaking the vehicle and rattling things around and you could tell something enormous is happening you know just 100 <laughs> meters behind you and and then right at t0 all of the power comes together there's this surge of 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 unbelievable force that comes through the vehicle and and now you're starting you have more thrust than weight you start to lift off the pad you watch the launch pad disappear through your window. And by the time you clear the top of the launch tower, you're already going 100 miles an hour, straight up, accelerating. And the vehicle shakes like crazy because it's it's not only battling its own internal vibrations, but it's having to shoulder its way through the resistance of the air. And, and so, so it, it's, it's a battering ram of a vehicle. And you're going faster and faster and faster. And you actually accelerate through the speed of sound uh, in, in 45 seconds from, from lying on your back. Now you're going faster than sound, 45 seconds later, accelerating straight up. And you go through, uh, there's a thing, uh, I was in a band called Max Q um, for a bunch of years. Yeah. And Max Q is, Max means maximum. Q is, is sort of like the pressure that's on your vehicle. It's, it's a combination of speed and area and everything yeah. and density of the air. And um, Max Q is the moment that your vehicle has the most air to push through while it's already going fast. And so that's where the vehicle shakes the most and it's rattling and rolling and, and rocking back and forth and just, just brute forcing its way up through the air. And then even though you're going faster and faster, the air gets thinner. So it's a little easier on the vehicle. You go through Mach 2, the, the speed of the Concorde in about uh, 70 seconds. You know, about as long as I've been answering this question. <laughs> now you're going twice the speed of sound. The after two minutes, the big rockets that have got you above the air are out of fuel and they explode off your vehicle, whether it's the Soyuz or the shuttle, in a yep. big flash of flame. You're already above the air, so the flame goes forwards too because there's nothing to hold it back. And you've been getting shaken and squished in your chair like, like a bunch of people were, were jumping on you and shaking you. But as soon as those solids are gone, now it's smooth. Now you got just uh -huh. liquid engines, but and you're above the air. So now it's just getting heavier and heavier and heavier as you accelerate harder and harder. Like one more person, or like maybe someone's so, pouring. Because of the G, that, that's why you're upside, why you're sitting back to make sure the blood goes to your head. 
That's right. But well, you're lying on your back, so it really just sort of flows to the back of your body. It's as if someone is pouring cement or sand on you, okay. and and until there's three or four times your own weight, depending which vehicle you're in, and so it becomes hard just to push your chest forward and get another breath in. But after about eight and a half minutes, this amazing human invention has got you well above the air, perfectly the right height, exactly the right direction, at as exquisitely the right speed to orbit the world, and the engine shut off, and you're weightless. Yeah, wow. <laughs> it, it, you'd love to ride, Paul. It's uh, wow. it's an, um, yeah, if you get the chance, for sure, take that yeah, ride. Man, it's, an, it's an it's an amazing yeah. one to take. And then, so what? What was? So your first spacewalk? The what? I mean, I read somewhere that it didn't quite go as planned. Well, uh, as far as I can recall, nothing ever went as planned in my <laughs> whole uh, six months off the planet, uh, and that's why the training takes so long because you can't just be ready for the things that are going to go as planned. That'd be easy. You have to be ready for everything to go wrong, uh, whether it's the rocket ship or the capsule coming back into the atmosphere or as you say, a spacewalk. Uh, spacewalks are, an, an, they're like a, the whole black belt of, of space flight. <laughs> uh, because now if you are going to be alone in the universe, it's not, it's not within the protection of your mothership. Yeah, You're yeah. out there by yourself and all that's protecting you from space is, you know, a few layers of cloth wrapped around your body, a, a rubber bag to keep the air in, and then some protective cloth in the outside and that, and that's you out in space. Wow. And it's what I dreamed of when yeah. I was a little boy. You know, I, I wanted to, to walk on the moon. I wanted to do a spacewalk. So on my second space flight, I, I was trusted to do one. I trained for about four years for those spacewalks. And it all comes down to that day. The suit weighs more than you do on Earth. It's more massive than you are. You have to build it around your body. It runs at a different pressure, a much lower pressure than the ship. So it takes a long time to get adapted into it. Uh, about four hours just to get dressed and ready to go outside. But eventually the moment comes and you, you crank this big thing to pull all the little dogs around the hatch. The hatch is freed up. You get the hatch out of the way and then you open the thermal cover and then you grab both sides of the hatch and you physically pull yourself wow. out into the universe. And I, I, was, I was just gobsmacked by it, overwhelmed, because yeah. as soon as you pull yourself outside, sure, there's the, the structure of the spaceship in front of yeah. you, a little bit of it, but then there's the entire Earth right over here and it's silently um, omnipresent, it, it's turning and it's but it's dead silent but it's every color in the rainbow and it's right there like yeah. like an enormous companion but but you're not you're not on the earth you're not even of the earth at yeah. that point it is it is just a planet that is separate from you and then when you look the other way it it is it's it's forever it's it's yeah. it's a it's a profound um limitless blackness that that you feel like you could somehow reach into and 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 uh, experience it and and you're in the middle of all that and and you got to work out there you're not out there recreationally <laughs> you know you well, have to somehow yeah. yeah put all that aside and Someone's focus calling, i need my satellite fixed <laughs> <laughs> you got to focus on 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 you know building a space station or repairing something that's broken mm -hmm. and and uh you have to mentally tear yourself away from the onslaught of the visual beauty that's going on yeah. to focus on the work around you. But every free second I got, yeah. I would try and just notice where I was so that so that I didn't come in from a spacewalk having missed it. I mean, I was, so that brings me to, to my next question, which was I've read a lot about this, what they call the overview effect. And that, that what you're just talking about seems to be a common thing that astronaut, all astronauts have experienced on some level where they you have a, uh, you know, a kind of deeply spiritual kind of moment of reflection where you realize that everything you know, you, everything you know, everything you've ever known, everyone you've ever known is down there below you. What, what was your reflection afterwards? Was it along, the, along those lines? Well, a little over 500 human beings uh, have left Earth. Uh, and there's quite a breadth of different types of people, you know, people from different countries, different cultures, Ooh. some very focused engineers, you yeah. know, or, or test pilots, very focused scientists. 
Um, and if you were to sit in, uh, I don't know, Royal Albert Hall, and 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 uh, thus Sprack Zarathustra was going to play, <laughs> you know, that great, powerful, moving, evocative bit of music, some people would 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 cry. Some yeah. people would just lose themselves in the magnificence of the variety of the sound. And some people would be texting. And some <laughs> people would be like, man, how soon is it until the break? Because everybody experiences uh, the wonders of life differently, I think. Or if you walk into St. Paul's or St. Peter's or into a, a gigantic forest or something, you tend to you tend to experience it sort of based on your own wiring and your own emotional state, yeah. but, but also on the, on the life that you've led. And I think the source of all spirituality is the ability to experience awe. Mm. Yeah, if, but... if, if something makes you awestruck, then, then perhaps you can start to wonder what is beyond that? What, what is the, what is the, the, the huge amount of, of things that exist that you are only barely aware of? And I feel that when, when music is magnificent or when, when I'm in a magnificent place. And to, to fly in space, and, and even more so to do a spacewalk, is as awe-inspiring as I can possibly imagine. Definitely as, as much as I've ever experienced. Wow. But we have very deep conversations on the whole subject of sort of overview on the spaceship. Yeah. You know, what? where are we in three-dimensionally right now? You know, yeah. think about where we are, but, <laughs> but we're, we're still very close to the world. You know, we're just yeah. going around it. Almost every, the earth is almost nothing. Everything that exists lies beyond our atmosphere. The, the infinity and the and the immensity of the universe and we're just one tiny little ball and, yeah. and so you have to try and understand the, the the almost unimaginable complexity of the huge numbers of size and time i mean we this universe has been here for 13 and a half billion years i mean what's a billion and you know how could you yeah, even no. start to grasp that but then you turn your gaze away from the universe and you look at, at this beautiful, you know, the, the blue colors right. and the green of our of the surface and the and the blues of the water. And and you realize that um, yes, the universe is enormous and limitless, but but this exquisite turning jewel of a place is also something that exists. And it's where you're from. And and we don't really know if there's life anywhere beyond Earth. We, we think there probably is, but, but we have no evidence yet, zero. All the life we have ever found is here on Earth. So then you start thinking, well, what if that is all the life that there is? Yeah. Then, wow, that, that makes this so infinitely more special and important. It's not just tremendously beautiful, but, but it may be uh, absolutely unique in what it means to the rest of the universe. Yeah. And maybe there's life out there, I don't know, but either way, it, it shows the finite, magnificent nature of our own planet. And, and it seems very difficult to reconcile within yourself that it's purely random, overwhelming. I'll be thinking about it, obviously, right through to my dying day, just yeah, trying, trying to sort all that out. And and uh, when so when you when people talk about the overview effect, it's very much that it is now being um, undeniably faced, slapped in the face with something that is so gorgeous and so huge and so ancient and part of something so limitless. Yeah. That how can you then reconcile it within your own understanding of life? And how then when you come back home after your space flight and you got to take the garbage out and you know you got to <laughs> earn a living and you you know you have to shave and just do all the normal stuff, you and know. still in the back of your mind that question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's 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 a, a a bottomless depth of richness to draw upon for the yeah. rest of your life also. And I'm really looking forward, we're almost there right now to the day where our spaceships are getting simple enough and therefore safe enough that you don't have to be 
uh, a, a test pilot engineer like myself yeah. to be on board, but we can actually take some of the most creative and, and uh, open-minded interpretive people that this planet has ever, ever produced and get them to experience oh, that. Wow. And, and, and then sh find ways to share that back with everybody else in, in, a, in a poetic and deep way that, that no astronaut's ever been able to. That's amazing. I mean, it gets, it was, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, you've answered about five of my questions in that one answer. It's, uh, I mean, do you think, do you think you actually, the experience you've had, the experiences you've had actually going out into space have, have changed how you've related to music in any way? Are there, is there music that you now that you've found that you, you, you hear, you hear things differently or? I, I mean, I think like like most people, uh, you can't separate yourself from music. You know, music is music is older than written history. I'm sure we were singing songs and and banging percussion, uh, you know, half a million years ago. Birds sing, uh, frogs sing, um, all all of the great apes, you know, have have a sense of of music and. Um, and we found musical instruments from 40,000 years ago. So, and so my own personal experience is that there's always music playing in my head. Uh, maybe one little thing on, on constant rewind or, or maybe running through a whole song while I'm exercising, while I'm doing something. There, there's always a soundtrack playing. And, and sometimes it's nonsense and sometimes it's a song I've written or a song somebody else has written. When you then get to a great set of circumstances, uh, it, the soundtrack becomes sort of part of what's happening and important. And normally you're not even aware of it. Like when you're watching a movie and there's a very good and, and supportive soundtrack, if it's properly done, you don't even know it's there. It just helps you get a feel for the place that you are or the, yeah. where the mu movie's trying to transport you to. And, and so having flown in space and, and spent half a year there, that soundtrack was in my head the whole time, but it's it's not distinct from the rest of the experience. It's no. it it becomes very much part of who I am. I was lucky enough to have had musical instruments in space with me. There's a guitar permanently up on the International Space Station, a little Canadian-made Larry Vey guitar, a lovely little six-string, um, and I played it almost every day up there. I wrote music. I uh, recorded an album. Uh, I covered some other people's music. I did cooperative music with uh, a Canadian band called the Bare Naked Ladies, and and with the Chieftains from Ireland, and um, and you know co-wrote stuff. And um, and whenever we had a celebration on board, of course, you'd having that floating guitar in there <laughs> for someone's birthday or an anniversary or a party or or some sort of you know, traditional holiday, obviously having that music there was an important part of it. As we backed away from the Mir space station back on my first space flight, they, they played music over the radio to us as we were backing away. They actually played, oh, those were the days, my friends, which is kind of a nice old folk song, but there's a Russian version of it. Uh, it's, it's in multiple languages. And the <laughs> Russian version is about this train station where where this train is coming through and it's both immensely lonely but also immensely hopeful uh about the meeting and and the, and the parting of life and um and so yeah uh my entire life but very much so my space flight experience has been uh has been chock full laced with music yeah. and and that affects how i i see all the imagery from space but when any of those songs is played, and, and the songs that I wrote and recorded there, they of course are um, uh, take me right back to to where I was as I was writing and recording them. Yeah. And, and and I'm really curious to see how when we start setting up a permanent base on the moon, and then eventually Mars, you know, once we sort it out, how music is going to evolve in that new place. How is Ooh, yeah. is bagpipe and Celtic music going to turn into bluegrass? And then eventually jazz, you know, without the Blue Ridge Mountains and without New Orleans, whole genres of music wouldn't exist. They needed a different environment, a different confluence of people in order to evolve music into a new level. And that's going to happen with every place we ever go, including 
you know, the first permanent uh, settlements on the moon. And it'll be lovely to see how all of this evolves as, as the new environments inspire us. I mean, it's also the distances that are involved. I mean, I was, I was thinking the other day that our nearest, the nearest galaxy to us is, is Andromeda. I believe. And the, oh and the, yeah, nearest galaxy. Yeah. When we look, I and mean, when we look up at when we look up at Andromeda in the night sky, the light that reaches our eyes as we're looking up at it, at this it, at potentially at this very moment, is two million years old. Yes. So, you know, it's way before human beings were even a, a sort of you know, <laughs> you know, a, you know, modern human beings only took two hundred thousand years old. So yeah, it, you know, the, the, as soon as you get to big numbers, it becomes very difficult for us to intuitively grasp it. You know, yeah. I can picture a hundred or a thousand or maybe even 10,000 of something. But when it starts to get the difference between 60,000 and 70,000 or a hundred thousand, suddenly it just, I, I, it's beyond my mental capacity. <laughs> and when you look, what's the difference between a million and a billion? You know, it seems like one letter, but it, but it's not, you know, yeah. or, or, or one billion to two billion. I want to be able to count, but you know, you, you just, those numbers are so huge. 11 seconds and 32 years, I think. Yeah, that's right. That, that's right. The, you know, uh, a million seconds is, I think, 12 or 13 days. Yeah. A billion seconds is 32 years. Yeah. So the step from a million to a billion is enormous. And and then when you're talking budgets, oh, a billion to a trillion, it, it becomes just as staggering yeah. Uh, a difference in, in, in enormity. So so distances in time, yeah, it's 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 almost unfathomable for us. But but you don't have to go very far back in human history to be absolutely staggered and inspired and amazed by the things we've invented and done just in my lifetime. You yeah. know, when I was born, no one had flown in space. Yeah. Space flight is younger than I am. <laughs> and yet we, we've been living on a space station for 20 years and, and we're in the process now of not just going to the moon to, to show that we can, but actually make that part of an Earth moon system, like a whole new continent that we're now going to settle on and, and, and figure out how to go further. We're, you know, we're, we're a clever ape, us. We, we, it's amazing <laughs> what we've come up with. And, 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 uh, and, but we need to inspire ourselves. We need to, 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 to create things that inspire our kids to, to want to go beyond what we've done so far. And, and it's all around us, but a large part of that is music. Imagine having watched 2001 A Space Odyssey if there'd been no soundtrack to it. Yeah, of it, course, it just yeah. would have been, it would have been empty. You know, it, it would have just been sort of like, a, you know, a silent movie with, with no impact. The, the, the visceral necessity to interweave our dreams with uh, our musical imaginings is yeah. absolutely vital in letting us see things that don't exist yet. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we did the, the, conversely, when, when I started trying to make a record about space, we, start, we, we were trying to do it purely, purely, purely with our imagination. Um, and then just quickly realized that, that we got, we'd find ourselves in the, in, the, in the sort of eternal void of space. Quite, you know, quite, quite often because, of course, so much of it is, you know, it, it requires imagination, and and you know, when your your imagination is focused on what the music's going to be doing, we, we thought the easiest thing to do was to actually set up a projector and run various sci-fi films, and of course, we got down to two thousand and one, and that was the one that was stuck on a loop because it really has hasn't been bettered, and and right. I think what what I, I it was only just it was only after I we started watching this on on repeat that I realised that film was actually made before. Before, before anyone had been, had been actually out and out into like low into Earth's orbit. That's so, right. So Kubrick was actually his idea of what the Earth looked like from outer space was actually pretty accurate. But but he, no, he didn't know it at the time. Yeah, there'd only been a tiny handful of space flights at that point. No one had gone beyond Earth orbit, and 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 yeah, the 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 brilliance and the bravery of the imagination of the people that put that, of Kubrick and Clark specifically, but that huge team of people. And I, I can still watch that movie uh, like it, like it's a brand new thing, yeah. uh, you know? And, and so I, we need the artistic, um, the artistic uh, fabrications of the edges of our imagination in order to help us try and picture something that we haven't been able technically to figure out how to do yet, but to inspire us to have the initiative. And, and a lot of the projects that are going on right now with, with space exploration are, are, are both inspired and driven by, by some of the science fiction dreams that we've had. 
Yeah, I mean, like obviously with the you know the, the, the way SpaceX is the, the speed at which someone like SpaceX and NASA are developing, you know, moving towards the 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 the, 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 the moon and Mars programs. I mean, if you, if you had the chance to go to Mars, even if it was one way, would you take it? Sure. I, I mean, uh, we're all on a one-way trip. Yeah, of course we are. Yeah. You know, so we tend to fool ourselves, but but we are. We're on a one-way trip, and and, and so the real question is what is important to you and what do you want to accomplish in your life what matters to you what do you value when when you look back after like when i look back after this conversation together there'll be some real nice thoughts and memories of, of the stuff that you and i have discussed and, and when you look back at the end of your day you know what what was interesting about today what did i get done that I, that means something to me and what part did i waste and how about this week and how about this month and this year or this life? And you could spend your entire life um, huddled under your covers and, yep. and try to prolong your life as long as possible. <laughs> and, but but then what if, have you really done what was important to you or not? Or, or you could take ridiculous risks and, and die as a teenager. And, and then have you made the right choices? For me, it is very much uh, these are the important things in my life, the things that give me a, a sense of satisfaction, a sense of grace, a sense of thrill, all, all put yeah. together. Um, how can I do as many of those as possible and make them part of who I am and then share them with as many people as I can in the four score and 10 years that I'm gonna get alive here? And what a grand adventure life can be. I, I've flown in space three times, I would love to have a chance to go live on the moon. I, I'm involved with several companies and I run a space foundation that are very actively involved in trying to make that possible. And eventually we'll figure it out on the way to Mars as well. There's a lot of problems to solve, but it didn't used to be easy to sail across the Atlantic or or whatever, and, and or to fly around the world. Nice. So, so I, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't want to abandon my family and, you know, I, I would like to, I, I want uh, to have the, the things that are important is all of the shared experience of my life. But, uh, but yeah, the allure of, of exploring the unknown and making that part of the enriched human experience, that, that's always driven me in and that sure hasn't stopped. Yeah, man, it's, it's, it's getting closer, isn't it? It is. Um, so any, any advice for budding astronauts? Oh, sure. Um, number one is uh, take care of your body. Yeah. If you're going to fly in space, you're going to be a long way from a hospital. So, <laughs> so think about your body, and you know it's not hard. You you have you have a choice every time you put something in your mouth. You yeah. have a choice. So think about what you put in your mouth, yeah. and um, and then exercise your body a little bit. So number one, number two, uh, when you're there, you're going to have to know how to do things without asking anyone, and so you're going to have to have complex technical knowledge to be an astronaut. So study, start learning, you know, actively engage your brain in understanding the, the things that you don't quite understand yet, the things that interest you. Um, and then the third is um, make decisions and stick with them. Like you, you can physically and mentally change who you are in a trivial way or in a lifelong way. If, if like, uh, I don't know how many instruments you play, Paul, but let's say here it is brand new in this month. If you said, you know, I don't know how to play, I don't know, a bassoon, an ultra bassoon. <laughs> By the end of September, I want to play this song on the ultra bassoon. I don't know, some, some cool, uh, I don't know, uh, elephantine kind of marching song or something. Fine, <laughs> something that suits the ultra bassoon. And then you get an ultra bassoon and every single day, I'm gonna spend three hours in the ultra bassoon. By the end of September or whatever, you're not gonna be the greatest ultra bassoon player in the world, but you will now know a lot more about that reed design for an ultra bassoon. You'll have learned a bunch of complexity with your fingers, you'll have changed. You'll have made some beautiful notes and a lot of horrible notes. <laughs> you'll never listen to a symphony the same again yeah. because you'll always be hearing that part of the music that used to be just part of the of the you know the the fabric of it and you will be a different person by the end of the month just because you made a decision and stuck with it yeah and and that physical plastic process by which you mold 
who you're going to be. That's absolutely necessary if you want to be an astronaut. You need to make decisions and stick with them. And yep. and decision making is is a skill. It's a perishable skill. So um, it, it's easy to just go ah, blame someone else, or that's above my pay grade, or nah, I could never do that. That's the easiest thing. But uh, I think taking care of your body, always being a, a, a student of learning and um, and learning how to make decisions and stick with them, those those will will. Uh, will set life. you on your path to be an astronaut, I think. Yeah, that's brilliant life advice, I think, for, for whatever you want to do. Well, yeah, I, I, it doesn't just apply to one thing, but it's yeah. it's it's what helped me get to do the things that I've done so far. Yeah, wow, it's amazing. Well, look, Chris, it's been absolutely amazing talking to you today. I, I feel very privileged to have had this, this conversation with you. And uh, and I've, 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 you've answered all my questions, all the questions I wanted to ask about uh, the experience, the experiences you've had, and uh, yeah, it's been fasc absolutely fascinating. Um, thanks for listening to my record, and uh, thanks for taking the time for me today. Well, it's a pleasure to talk to you, Paul. I really look forward to hearing all the music that you create, the new album, especially with uh, with uh, all of the space inspiration and space yeah. themes, uh, all the way that it's going to be presented. Whether it's just listening to it, or the visuals that come along, or that that beautiful view out the front of the spaceship of all the imagined things pouring past yeah. uh, I, I'm very much looking forward to experiencing imagination through uh, through your creativity and, and it was a delight to speak Quite with well. you yeah thanks man I'll take care okay take care bye bye, bye.